Whenever the subject of the end times, the last days, is raised, usually soon thereafter, there's a very frequent question that is asked. And what is that question? Who or what is the restrainer? You see, the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verses 6 and 7, he speaks about that which restrains and the one who restrains. And for some reason, there is a great interest in knowing who that one is. But here's the problem. The Bible does not reveal who the restrainer is. And there's a very important rule that one who teaches the Bible should follow. If the scripture does not answer the question, then we should not answer it either. It is dangerous to put forth something that the word of God does not answer, does not reveal. And usually why people are so interested in answering that question is one of a couple reasons. First of all, they want to sensationalize their their ministry. They'll have a, a video that is all about revealing who the restrainer is to kind of pull in the viewers. Another reason is because they are attached to a denomination, a movement, an organization, and they, because of their theology, sometimes related theological doctrine, they believe they have to answer that question in order to support, in order to hold together something else that they teach. And that in and of itself is rather problematic. What we see is that there are many different answers to that question, who the restrainer is. And what I'll say, share with you is this. When you look at one who teaches it, usually they are more concerned with a theological position than they are in doing an accurate job of, of teaching the text. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, I want to, for the most part, Simply speak about verses 6 and 7. But the problem is, unless we have the right perspective, that we see the context that leads up to what Paul says in verses 6 and 7, unless we see that, we're not going to be able to understand what he's saying and what he is not saying, what he reveals and what he does not reveal. So this is going to give us, hopefully, a few points to remember when we hear other people teach about the last days. So let's begin. The first thing we see in this chapter is that Paul is speaking to believers. How do I know that? Because the text tells me we should always be able to form theological beliefs, perspectives, doctrines based upon what the scripture says. We read in verse one, but we beseech you, brethren. Now that word brethren is speaking about believers. It can be male believers or female believers. He's speaking to those who are part of that congregation in Thessaloniki. And they, and I'm not the only one that sees it this way. In fact, most commentators do. They have a question. They have a concern. They've been listening to others, and others have been telling them that they've missed out on something. And missing out on this has caused them great concern, great fear. They're very uneasy about where they are because they have believed what they've heard rather than believing what has been written to them, and what Paul personally has taught them. So look again. We see what the subject is. But we beseech you, brethren, in behalf of the parousia. Now that word parousia simply is the word for coming. 
the word for arrival. And in the scripture, it has to do with Messiah's coming. But here's the problem. It is not clear just in this word alone whether it's the second coming at the end of the day of the Lord. Now, let's learn this term, the day of the Lord. That is an Old Testament term that appears frequently in the Old Testament, prophetically in those writings. But it's very rare. It only appears, I believe, one time in the New Testament, the day of the Lord. And that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What's more common is another term in the New Testament that most people have never heard of. And this is the day of Christ or the day of the Lord Jesus or the Lord Jesus Christ. So the day of Christ, what is that? Well, whereas the day of the Lord speaks about God's judgment, his wrath being poured out upon this world. The day of Christ, as we'll see in a moment, speaks of a day whereby we, the believers, are gathered to him. In fact, that we are removed from this world in order that we do not experience the wrath of God. Now, here again, let's just read what the scripture says. Verse 1. We beseech you, brethren, in behalf of the coming of our Lord, Messiah, Yeshua. So it has to do with the coming of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua. But until this time, we don't know. It's speaking about the second coming at the end of God's judgment, the period of his wrath, or are we speaking about our blessed hope, the rapture? What happens before God's wrath is poured out upon this world? Up until now, we do not know but as we keep reading, it gets clearer. And not just clearer, it becomes very clear, most clear, because it continues. And are gathering unto him. Now that has to be the rapture. Why? Well, let me give you a scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13. It tells us that when Messiah comes, and here we're speaking about his second coming, when he comes the second time at the end of the day of the Lord, the saints, that's you and me, we're going to be coming with him. So the second coming is not believers being gathered unto him. That has nothing to do with the second coming. It has to do with the rapture, with the blessed hope. So he says here, and our being gathered together unto, unto him. Now, did you hear that? Unto, unto him. The word epi, it appears twice here. With the verb being gathered together unto, and then unto him. It's redundant. But it has the purpose of emphasizing us being with him being gathered to him. And that is a clear description of the rapture, him gathering us up unto him, not the second coming. And, and I would argue that most people see it this way. He says, trying to reassure this, these believers, this congregation in Thessaloniki, he says that you not be quickly shaken from the, the proper perspective, the right vantage point. What is that based upon? The word of God and Paul's teaching. He said, don't allow what others are saying. And as we read on in this, this, this verse, it says, don't let you be troubled by, by some spiritual happening or some word that's said, or even some epistle that is written that purports to be from us. Paul said, we have nothing different to tell you. What we told you the first time, what we discipled you on, it stands. So don't believe 
because of some spiritual event, some word that you hear, or some epistle that, that purportedly is from us. That what? Notice what he says. As that the day of Christ has, has come, has, has happened, has drawn near is what it literally says, has approached. Now, again, it's very important that we translate this, the day of Christ and not the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. We, we don't need to, to be asking questions, is this the day of the Lord? We know in the book of Revelation, these, these trumpet judgment, these bold judgments, what things that are going to be happening, things that have never taken place, things that there's no other explanation then they are, are the wrath of God. When you are in the wrath of God, you don't need to say to someone, do you, do you think this is God's wrath? <laughs> it's going to be, and here's the word, painfully obvious, this is God's wrath. Praise God, we won't be in that situation if you are a believer, if you have accepted the gospel. This is not what they're asking. They're saying, because they are being persecuted, wait, have we missed out? On the day of, of Christ, the rapture, the blessed hope. And Paul says, don't change your vantage point. Don't change your perspective. Don't be troubled. Don't let anyone deceive you that this day has come. The blessed hope, the rapture. Because he says, what has to happen first? Now, let's be real clear. Look, if you would, to verse 3. He says, don't let... A certain one, that means anyone, deceive you by any means. I think that's pretty clear. And the reason why he's saying this is because we know Messiah's taught this. In the end times, leading up to it and within it, there's going to be many false teachers, many false prophets, and also many, many individuals that are going to be proclaiming that they are Messiah. All of this is false. I think it's very significant in our days when this is being recorded. There is a movement that's saying that God has restored the apostles and the prophets. This lays the foundation for false teachers, for these false prophets to say, I come with authority. I'm an apostle sent by God. No, you're not. Not in that way that the early apostles were. You don't have the authority. We're all brothers. The authority is in this word, not in a man or a woman. They are dangerous. Be clear on that. So he says, don't let anyone deceive you by any means that it should not come. Now, the language here is a little bit confusing. That day of Messiah will not come. It will not be until first there should be a few things. And what is that? Well, he tells us that day will not come unless first there's the apostasy. What's the apostasy? Well, this word refers to a departure. Now, I have a friend, and I have great respect for him, but we disagree on this issue, that's okay. It doesn't mean that we stop being friends, that we stop respecting one another. But, but he says, and he's not alone, there's others to teach. No, no, this apostasy, they say, is not false teaching, but the word here is simply the word for departure. That's true. And they say it's the departure, it's the rapture that the apostasy, apostasy refers to. No, it's not. The term apostasy, do you know where it appears in the scripture? It appears, for example, in Acts 21, verse 21, where Paul is being accused of heresy, of false teaching, of departing from the Torah truth and teaching false things. Paul didn't do that. He was falsely being accused of, of apostasy. And likewise, in Matthew, for example, Matthew chapter 5, Messiah is talking about divorce and giving a certificate of divorce. And he calls that a certificate of apostasy. Why? 
Because moving away from marriage, you're leaving that which is good and departing for something that's not good. Something that's rooted in disobedience. So he says, before the day of Christ comes, the rapture, he says, first of all, there's the apostasy. And the apostasy, after saying this, the apostasy should come first and, and this is an important conjunction, it unites the apostasy as the foundation, as laying the foundation for another event. And what is that? And the man of sin to be revealed. Notice, to be revealed is in the past of something causes it. And what causes it? It's the apostasy. They are linked together. And notice something else. This one who is called the, the man of sin, he's also called the son of perdition. And what is this revealing? How is he revealed? He tells us. The one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that, that he in the temple of God. Now, literally, it's not the word temple. That would be Hiron. It's the word neos. Here it's in the form of neon. It's in the, the accusative. So it's the word sanctuary, the sanctuary of God. That's why it's so important to pay attention to the original language. Not temple, but sanctuary, referring to the Holy of Holies. Now, what Paul is doing is what Paul frequently does. In order to support what the Holy Spirit has inspired him to write down, he uses the Old Testament. This verse, when he says here, look at it carefully. I'm reading from verse 4, where it says in the middle of verse 4, the one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that worship, that he sits as God in the temple or the sanctuary of God, manifesting himself to be God. This is Paul referring back to the book of Daniel chapter 11 and verse 36. Now, if you're wise, you'll stop the video and you'll go there and look at that verse and you'll see the, con the, the connection, the consistency. So Paul says that before the day of Christ comes, what's going to happen? We see that there's going to be the revealing of the man of sin, the son of perdition who commits the abomination of desolation. When he speaks about the abomination of desolation the first time and in the book of Daniel chapter 9, he just gives it its name. But it's later on in chapter 11 and chapter 12, he defines it. He gives a description. And that is him going into the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary of God, where he sits upon the, the, the Ark of the Covenant and where he proclaims that he is God and that he has to be worshipped. That event's going to happen. Isn't it interesting that Yeshua himself in Matthew 24, he says before the end comes, what end is he speaking about? The end of the church age because he's speaking to disciples. He says you're going to be persecuted. All these horrible things are going to happen. You're going to be betrayed. You're going to be delivered over to death. But before the end should come, the gospel is going to be preached the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. Then the end will happen. And he says, when you, still speaking to the disciples, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, notice the pronoun, second person, plural, you. When you see, speaking to believers. And right after that abomination of desolation that's mentioned in Matthew 24, verse 15, he turns to Israel. Why? Because the rapture has happened. Now, because of Israel's refusal to accept the Antichrist, Israel goes through that time of Jacob's trouble. So we see here that before the day of Christ, now this is what many people do. There's a well-known teacher from, from the Los Angeles area, and he has a video on this. He does a very good job pointing out many 
sound biblical truths. And he points out what we're speaking about in this section, verses 4, for example, and in verse 3 and 4, where it talks about the apostasy, the revealing of the man of sin, and the abomination and desolation, he says it all happens at the midway point. But he says it has nothing to do with the rapture. The rapture happens before the seven years begin, he claims. And this is after. My question for him is this. But the context is the day of Messiah. They're not asking about what's going to begin this this wrath of God, what event. They're not asking for that. They want to know about the day of Messiah, the rapture. And what he says is that day will not happen until the apostasy takes place, which is connected to the revealing of the Antichrist, this man of sin, the son of perdition, And how is he going to be revealed? He's going to be revealed by committing the abomination of desolation, which Daniel tells us in Daniel 11, verse 36, is him going into the sanctuary and proclaiming himself God and demanding all people worship him. That's what Paul is saying. He's following what Daniel's revealing. Now look, if you would, to to verse, verse 5. Do you not remember that while I was still being with you, these things I said to you? Verse 6. So now we've, we've spoken around 22 minutes, and we're ready now for the two primary verses. And what I want you to see here is that Paul is not revealing who the restrainer is but what the restrainer does. I want to say that again. Paul is not interested in revealing who the restrainer is, but rather what the restrainer does. Let's look at verse 6. And now, this is the Greek word noon. It means at this moment, and what he's speaking about here is now at this moment, I want to reveal something more to you. And what is that? That which restrains. So we're here at this issue, the restrainer. Now, most people that teach on this ignores the fact uh, the, the individual from Los Angeles, he did an excellent job being faithful to the text in these next two verses. He, he wanted to unhitch this whole issue from the rapture, which I believe is wrong based upon the day of Christ. He wants to say it's the day of the Lord, but that doesn't fit the context. The, the, the clues within the text about us being gathered together unto, unto him and the term day of Christ. But putting that aside, he points out that in verse 6, we have a participle, a participle, is a a verb and an adjective that's put together. That's the best understanding of a participle. What does a verb do? A verb speaks about an action. An adjective is a particle of describing. So this describes one who does the action. It's very frequent in the Greek language. And what's important here is that this participle is neuter. What does that mean? Well, whoever the subject is, whoever, whatever, it's neuter. Now, this eliminates the church because the church is a a feminine noun. So it can't be speaking about the church here. And if you, for example, and I agree with this individual, if you believe that the rapture takes place prior to just before those last seven years. And the events that he's been speaking about is in the middle. Of course, this has nothing to do with with the church. The church cannot be the restrainer. So anyone who says the church is what restrains, they have a serious problem. So he says here, verse 6, 
And now that which restrains, you know, for the revealing of him that for him to be revealed in its season. I want to read that again. See, here's the problem. Most people understand this passage saying this. And that which which restrains, you know. They put the you knowing with the restrainer. Now, most people will say this is because Paul perhaps revealed it to them earlier. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. We don't know. He taught them things, but, and of course, the previous verse, verse 5 says, do you not remember that while being still with you, these things I taught you? So maybe he did, but we don't know, and the text doesn't reveal it. But the key thing here is this. This phrase, oi date, does not go with knowing the restraint. We should not read it, and now you know what restraints. It's not in that order. It says, and now that which restrains, and then he goes on to say, you know, you know why he restrains. For him, meaning the Antichrist, to be revealed in his season. So what we know is not who the restrainer is, but we know why he restrains or or why it in this case it's neuter why it restrains and that is so the antichrist is not revealed prior to his time who sets that time not the antichrist not satan but god does god says you are going to be restrained who or what is restraining him we don't know Why he's being restrained, this we know. He tells us, you know, for him to be revealed in his season. So the restrainer in verse 6 is neuter. It speaks about it, that could refer to a force, a power, or a, a noun that is in the neuter construction. Then it says, Look at verse verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness. Now, this word lawlessness is very important. It's a word that speaks of one or a characteristic that is against the Torah. The word law, nomos, is in Hebrew, Torah. So it's a being against the law. What we learned is this. That the Antichrist, he's a man of lawlessness. He's against the Torah. So it's very dangerous if you have a theology that is against the Torah, that you see that is bad, you're agreeing with the Antichrist. It's that spirit, that that uh, character that is going to, to really characterize the work of the Antichrist. And what Paul says here, look again, verse verse 7. For now the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This is true in his day, and it's true now. The Antichrist has not been revealed, but the characteristic, the behavior, the attitude of the Antichrist, his uh, character has been and is functioning mightily in this world. That's why it's a world of darkness, a world of sin, a world of falsehood, a world of darkness, because the the character of the Antichrist is, is at work in this world. He goes on only, and this is the word monon, monon from mano, meaning one or only, only, and notice what he says, the one who restrains now. The one who restrains is in the third person, and it's masculine. So it would be he. Now, there's a Bible teacher, and he goes through saying that the restrainer is he, he, he. And he he points out that the pronoun that is used to, to describe him is the Greek word ho. 
But the problem is that's in this verse. He totally ignored what it says in verse 6 when the pronoun that describes him is the word to. Not ho, but to, neuter. So this reveals a different description of that same restraint. It talks about his power, his power to restrain, and his power to, to restrain for him not to be revealed only in his season. But in verse 7 it says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work only he who restrains. And it says, he who is restraining now, he's doing so now, and he will continue to do so until out of the midst he should be. Now, here's a problem. Hopefully you're following along, and you should check many translations. So many times, and many of the, the, the people who teach on it, their videos, talks about the restrainer being removed. He is not removed. This goes along with the false teaching that the restrainer is, is tied in some way to the church. They'll say it's the Holy Spirit. Now, I have no problem. The Holy Spirit, because the, the Greek word that, that's, that is used for spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the word panuma. And if you know Greek, that ending, that ma, shows a neuter noun. So the, the force could be the power of the Holy Spirit restraining him. But in verse 7, it uses the term he referring to the Holy Spirit. And, and our friend from California, he pointed out how the Holy Spirit is described with the neuter, but also the masculine. So it may very well be a reference to the Holy Spirit in this passage, but we can't be dogmatic about it. And these people who teach that the Holy Spirit is removed, we should understand the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. Therefore, he is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He cannot be removed. And we should not associate the Holy Spirit, define him by the church saying, well, if the Holy Spirit is removed, the church has to go with him. That's ridiculous. It's heresy to, to unite them in this close way. Certainly, those who are part of the church have the Holy Spirit, or they wouldn't be part of the congregation of the redeemed. But the Holy Spirit is beyond the church. Very important that we see this. So what the scripture says here is simply, verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains now, it's a different word for now, the word RT, not the word noon, until simply ech misos. Here it's in the genitive because the word ek is always in the genitive, so it takes the genitive misu. Misu means ech misu, out of the middle. It does not at all refer to a removal, but simply moving aside. Think of it this way, two people walking, and they block each other until one moves aside. He's not removed. He's not taken away. He just stands aside. And it's a reference to the Holy Spirit simply allowing for the revealing of the Antichrist. So it says, he is restraining now until he moves aside. And this moving aside is going to, I believe, is what's going to allow him to do that abomination of desolation. And it's the abomination of desolation based upon what Paul says is going to be the last event that the congregation of redeemed cease now this happens in the middle point but the rapture is soon thereafter no man knows the day or the hour but what you find is this everyone who wants to put it before daniel's 70th week they have a theological problem 
They have to say, oh, this is speaking about the day of the Lord. No, speaking about the day of Christ. They have to say that what Paul is saying, I want to give you a sign, a few indicators that that day won't occur until first these things happen. They are forced, like our friend from California, to say, no, all of these things unrelated to the rapture. When that the heart of this question that Paul is addressing has to do with the rapture. It's just an example of individuals wanting to hold on to a theological doctrine at all costs, even if it brings about confusion and not being true to the, the desire of the text, what the text is desiring to answer. We need to be people that take the study of God's word with the utmost seriousness. I'll close with that. Thank you for watching.